Right, first things first, no corgi today. If you've seen any of my other long-term reports, you'll know I usually have my dog right alongside me, but just over there is one of Sydney's finest driving roads, and doggy sick is not a fun thing to clean out of cars, so the pup's been left at home for this one. What we do have though, is the Ford Puma ST line, the brand's smallest, and in my opinion, most unfairly overlooked SUV. So what the hell are we doing here with it? Well, having just spent three months behind the wheel of the Puma, I seriously reckon it serves up one of the better driving experiences in the segment. It's not fast, sure, but it's something far more important. It's fun. So I figured I'd drag you all the way out here with me to show you what I'm talking about. And I'll tell you the three things I like and the three things I don't about the Ford Puma 2. So let's hop to it. But first, make sure you hit subscribe to stay on top of all of our latest videos and jump on over to carsguide.com.au to get the full skinny on thousands of new cars. Okay, let's talk design for a second because I reckon the Puma looks pretty cool. Still, opinions are a little divided. Some people tell me they reckon it looks like it's trying a bit too hard, but I disagree. I reckon the worst sin a car can commit is to be boring, whether that's to look at or to drive, and I can tell you the Puma looks fun because it is fun. That awesome flat paintwork, by the way, is called grey matter, and I reckon the 17 inch alloys look massive on a car this size too. It all looks kind of premium, right? And that feeling continues inside. Yes, it's expensive, but you do get plenty for your money. Even the entry-level cars get 17-inch alloy wheels, an 8-inch screen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, climate control, navigation, push-button start, an embedded modem, the list goes on. ST-line cars like this one add a 12.3-inch display in the driver's binnacle, which is awesome. You also get flappy paddle shifters and these great LED DRLs which frame the headlights, as well as a sportier kind of look outside overall. And there's plenty of tech and safety stuff too, like wireless charging and auto park function, adaptive cruise control, everything you want really. I know I promised you a car that's fun to drive, and I know you didn't believe me. After all, the Puma's powered by a tiny one litre petrol engine that produces a hardly soul-stirring 92 kilowatts and 170 newton metres, which pairs with a seven-speed dual-clutch auto, sending the grunt to the front tyres. But I'm here to tell you the Puma is anything but dull. In fact, when driven with a little gusto, it serves up one of the better drive experiences in the segment. From the scintillating soundtrack of that hard-working three-cylinder engine to the responsive accelerator feel and the engaged and engaging ride, it's the kind of car that, though not in any way fast, puts a little smile on your face every time you climb into it. There's something that I absolutely love about three-cylinder engines. Part of it's the soundtrack, that kind of almost sports car burble they produce when you put your foot down, but it's also just kind of the ridiculousness of it all. This is a one litre three cylinder engine. It is absolutely tiny, and yet it produces more than enough grunt to keep this thing feeling pretty entertaining and pretty fun. Now it's not fast, but it almost doesn't need to be. It's kind of got that old MX-5 kind of feeling about it. That sense of having a really good time behind the wheel without ever feeling like you're really breaking the speed limit. And in Sydney and Victoria and everywhere else in Australia for that matter, where our roads are festooned with speed cameras, that's a good thing. It means you can have fun behind the wheel without really breaking the law. One thing you would say though is that it's, it's not a sports car. While the engine and the accelerator and the ride and handling all feel really great, the steering's not super sharp and it doesn't really feel like it's gripping the road all that well when you really throw it into bends. But again, it's, it's not designed to be a sports car. It's a small, in fact, microscopic SUV that you can still have a good time in. Now, if it sounds like I'm spending a lot of time talking about the way this car drives, it's because I am. The reality is so many vehicles in this segment feel almost like an afterthought for car companies, but this one doesn't. This one does feel like it's been engineered to produce a smile, which is really cool. Now, there are some downsides to this vague sense of rawdiness and sportiness that this car delivers, and that is that it's not quite as accomplished in the city as it is on a road like this. There is a kind of jerky lurchiness to the way the car accelerates at slow speeds, unless you're really gentle with it, and it does take a little bit of getting used to. You basically have two options. You can either drive it slowly, gently, and carefully, or you can drive it with a little bit of enthusiasm, 
but there's really no middle ground. If you try to sort of straddle those two worlds, it's not the smoothest driving car around. Now, the other thing that I've absolutely hated over the summer months with this car is that the start-stop function really does take all the energy out of the air conditioning system too. So on a summer day, you really have to turn it off. Otherwise, every time you stop at a red light, you can feel the car heating up like a Swedish sauna before it finally kicks in when you take off again. It's genuinely unpleasant and you end up just turning it off and forgetting about it. Long story short though, it's a small SUV that really does a fairly passable impression of a sports car. From the drive modes, you can flick it into sport, and just have it all feel a little bit more responsive to the flappy paddles on the steering wheel that'll change gears for you when you're barreling into a corner. It really is more fun than you probably expect it to be and well worth the test drive if driving enjoyment is high on your wish list. Right, let's talk money for a moment because the Puma family, it ain't cheap. Remember, this plays in the light SUV category, which is famous for serving up all sorts of affordable metal. The Puma family, however, starts at around 30K, tops out at around 35K, with this, the ST line, sitting smack in the middle at about 32K. And in my opinion, that's a lot of money to spend on a car that's about the same size as a tennis shoe, even if you do get a lot of equipment to help justify that price. It's worth pointing out here that not all small SUVs are created equal. It's a kind of catch-all title that speaks to vague dimensions, but the exact space and practicality those dimensions deliver can be wildly different. In fact, some SUVs are so small, they can't even be classed as small SUVs. Instead, they're classified as light, the smallest category we've got. And it's in this jungle that the Puma prowls, not fighting against cars like the Kia Seltos and the Mitsubishi ASX, but against smaller models like the Mazda CX-3 and the Hyundai Venue. Short answer, if you're going to put adult-sized people in the back seat on a regular basis, then you really should test the Puma's back seat before plonking down your deposit, because the space back there is, well, rather tight. I'm only 175 centimeters tall, and while my hair kind of brushes the roof line, and my knees don't quite hit the seats in front, but there is an undeniable sense of claustrophobia to the Puma back seat experience. Now, it's worth pointing out too that this car only measures just over 1.8 meters in width. So if you're thinking you're gonna get three adults across the back seat in anything approaching comfort, you can think again. Boot space, however, is good, with 410 liters on offer with the rear seats in place. That's significantly more than the Mazda CX-3 and more than the Hyundai Venue too. Yes, I know it sounds like I'm splitting hairs here, but it irks me that I have to put up with fabric seats. If I'm spending mid thirties on a car in this segment, I expect something more than cloth on my seats. The Mazda CX-3 Touring, for example, gets partial leather and all wheel drive, and it's about the same money. It, I know it's a tiny thing, but it just bugs me when it feels like you're getting less than you paid for. Remember earlier when I said that this had been unfairly overlooked? What I meant by that was that in January 2021, Ford sold around 200 of these. The Mazda CX-3, it sold more than 1,300. The Toyota Yaris Cross, more than 500. The Hyundai Venue, more than 400. And to me, that's a crying shame because Ford really has produced a car here that's both fun to look at and fun to drive. And that's kind of rare in this segment. 